I think we can start and whomever joins, just joins. Hey everyone, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. We're very happy to be hosting this. We're absolutely not used to hosting anything like that online. We like the live events, but we'll have a try while hoping that this will get to see each other soon. Um, so uh, this is this event is uh, organized by Mashallah, uh, which is Jenny, Clement, and I, uh, and for the launch of our newest series about inner migration. We have some uh, some mini rules for this call. Um, first, if you can all mute yourself, I think you all have, uh, but like make sure that uh, this is the case. Um, Second, um, we'll be having a discussion um, in the beginning, but we're very open to, acute, to uh, questions in the end. So if you ha ever have any questions, just write them down in the chat box and we'll give you the opportunity uh, to share your thoughts afterwards. Um, and uh, yeah, and um, most of us are currently in Beirut or in Syria. So, and the power has been terrible. Um, terrible so we might we expect electricity cuts and if that happens um it would be great if you can prepare for a song or something and, and take over up until we come back so thank you yeah you might end up being the host of the meeting at some point so fear not whoever is not in lebanon or syria um so it's great to uh, see a lot of familiar faces actually mm -hmm. so i mean many of you know probably who mashada news are and uh, for those of you who don't, uh, we are an online media platform, online collaborative media platform, and we have uh, been publishing for more than 10 years now. So we actually started kind of at the same time as the um, protest began in Tunisia, like 10 years ago. So that's how old or young we are. We publish story stories from all across the region, kind of spanning from Morocco, the North Africa, all the way to Iran and the Gulf. So what we want to be is uh, a space for these kind of less told stories that you don't see a lot in conventional media. So it spans from culture and art to urban issues, uh, society, current history, people's everyday life, these kind of things. So we do this because we really believe in the power of stories and storytelling um, and how they really help us to see the world in new ways, how they help us connect to people and places how they uh, help us to discover new things. Um, so yeah, you have the editorial team with you tonight. Misha, who just welcomed you. Uh, she's in Beirut. It's uh, Clement, who you can see here also. He's uh, calling from Tbilisi in Georgia. And myself, I'm also in Beirut. So we have been part of the team since we started. I mean, we have had like a few members come and go, but uh, we have been the core team. So what do we do apart from publishing stories? We have uh, been doing very nice projects in the past few years. We have been hosting workshops and uh, trainings. So they all they all focus on migration, how we can tell stories about migration in better ways. And um, I think, oh yeah, many of the, um, almost all of the authors for the series were part of these workshops in different ways. So the series that we will speak about tonight, it uh, really is connected to this, uh, project on workshops on migration. And um, it's on the theme of inner migration. So let's see, we can maybe check some of the story series that we did because we have this tradition of doing series with Mashala News. It's the, I mean, it kind of goes back also to when we first started. So we like this idea of curating series on specific topics. So you can see some of the past topics and um, the past, uh, the current one and the past one were both on migration. So this one is um, on inner migration. Um, which, I mean, the, the topic of migration is really something that is so uh, endlessly broad and really cuts across all of uh, all human experiences from mobility, displacement to exodus, arrivals and departure. And whatever form it takes, it, I mean, it always starts with one thing, which is the change of location. And um, I guess all of us in this past year of uh, this global pandemic, we have been living in really strange times. We have seen the world around us change in ways that we could never expect. And our lives have really changed and they have become defined by um, closures, lockdowns, curfews, confinements, uh, border, borders that have been shut. 
So living in these times made us really think about the concept of migration in times like this. What does migration mean? How do we migrate or not migrate? What happens to the self when we migrate? Uh, what memories are evoked? What dreams are evoked? What feelings of uh, loss, grief, sorrow, or even joy, discovery? What kind of feelings are um, come to visit us in this pro process? So we, um, to find answers to this, we invited different people to tell stories about this. And uh, some of them are with us tonight, three of the authors and the, the illustrator, photographer who did the illustrations. So yeah, Misha, if you want to introduce the panelists a bit more. Thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, what was cool about um, this uh, series and our other series at the same time is that we had a call, as Jenny said, uh, for contributors, and we generally are not sure what to expect. So we have broad ideas of, of the topic by itself. We brainstorm ideas. But what's good about just having an open call is discovering uh, how people interpreted the topic and how they made it their personal topic at the same time in ways that sometimes we didn't even think of while putting it together beforehand. And we were very happy to have that for inner migration as well. Um, so. Um, all the stories in the end ended up being interconnected in a way, uh, which I, um, I don't know, I, I personally wasn't expecting. And it was nice to see uh, the, the stories come together and see how some are linked to each other without making it on purpose uh, because the authors didn't work together. Um, so that was the beauty of it. And uh, our three panelists um, took part, wrote beautiful stories. Uh, first, I'll introduce Ibrahim Nami, who's a creator and uh, a writer from Lebanon. And his work has been, has, is a mix between journalism, activism, and creative expression. And he's the founder of a magazine called The Outpost, which covers uh, creative stories around uh, the Arab world in uh, such a beautiful way. And uh, many of the, all of the issues are online now, right? Um, and uh, Ibrahim wrote uh, about his experience with the Beirut explosion, what happened to him and his journey back to, um, to health. And uh, he, he, wrote about how he decided to go back to the village and to heal there and to be connected to the grounds and, and to the olive trees that, uh, that are um, uh, well known in this region. Um, the second story was written uh, by Fatima al Haji. Uh, she's a freelance journalist and she's with us in the call. Um, she's a freelance journalist and activist from Syria, and she works uh, uh, on around topics like refugees and human rights, and she is currently based in Berlin. And Fatima wrote about her uh, double migration uh, story, how she uh, went to, um, uh, she, how she left Damascus and uh, uh, to go to Beirut first, and then decided to leave Beirut in 2019 and, uh, and uh, go to Berlin. So she recounted her story behind that and her experience uh, in this migration. And the third person with us in this call is, um, uh, is Sara Khazim. Uh, who is uh, joining us from uh, Latakia in Syria. She's a creative writer and social political activist. Um, and she also is a literary studies graduate. And her piece was um, unlike the others about deciding to stay um, when her loved ones have left Syria. So it's her um, recounting of how it is to readapt in a city where people have left. Uh, but she also talks with, about her link and her trips to Beirut, which were a temporary shelter uh, when things went bad. Um, and, and her piece has a lot of, um, of emotions about love, about longing, about roots and belonging. Um, and the, the other pieces uh, were, uh, and some of our authors are actually here. There's Hassan al-Hajj Hassan, who told the tale of three brothers 
um, who, um, who are divided and uh, who have to deal with migration. Two decide to join their mother who is abroad. And the third one, the narrator decides to stay. And so it's the story of these brothers of how, um, uh, of how migration changes links in the family, the, how some things can be unfair and what happens afterwards, uh, separation, um, meeting up, uh, getting back together. Um, and um, the story, there's another story written by Hamoud Mjaydel, who recounted the story of Abu Khalil, uh, a man who left Palestine uh, during the Nakba and uh, who went with his family to Jordan and then to uh, settled in Damascus and um, to build a life there and then had to leave uh, during the war and came to Lebanon. So it's the personal story uh, told in the first person of what happened uh, through this history and this journey. Um, and uh, then we have two stories that are more connected to Lebanon and to what has been happening in the past few uh, past year with the pandemic, with Ghadir Hamadi, who describes her confinement in her uh, family village uh, in the south, and how uh, the lockdown has changed her perception about life, about goals, about uh, what is sure, what is settled, and uh, what matters in the end. And the last story, the seventh story, uh, was written by Sara Lili Yassin and Jenny, who spoke in the beginning. Um, and uh, because they started a correspondence when the first lockdown happened in, in Lebanon. And in those letters that they exchanged, uh, wrote to each other, they described, uh, they described how the city was changing, how the city was uh, during their walks, what they saw, the green spaces, the plants that they would see, the protests, um, the walking families, and and so it's a nice um, view and personal view of how the city has been changing uh, during the lockdown. Um, so thank you. Uh, uh, and also there's, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Aud Nasser, who's a French Lebanese illustrator and photographer who's based in Paris. And she's been the one behind all the beautiful illustrations um, who interpreted um, the, the texts, received the text, had her own interpretation and shared her own spin to, uh, to what has been produced. And, uh, and we're very, very happy to have Aude with us and um, we'll be also talking about her creative process. Um, so I, I will be asking some questions in the beginning. And uh, again, uh, if you ever have other questions, um, please do ask them in the chat box uh, and we'll be discussing them afterwards. Uh, I wanted to talk first uh, to Brahim, and it's going to be the same question for Fatima and then for, for Sara. Why did you choose to write about your topic? Um, how do you feel uh, your topic was connected to the topic, to the theme of inner migration? Hi, Visha. Hi, everyone. Hi. So good to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, and also, you know, for giving me the space to articulate all that I wrote about um, that was uh, very therapeutic in so many ways, so thank you. Uh, and in many ways also, there was no other way I could write about anything else. Um, I think the story started in incubating on that day and kept on brewing in my head for the five months that followed. Um, and even like from the very first day, I decided to keep, a, you know, just a documentation of this healing journey. Um, so I kept on, I kept, I kept on writing and documenting and reflecting about this journey in this book, in this notebook. Um, so in a way, what I'm trying to say, I guess, is that the story kind of wrote itself in my back, in the back of my mind. And then when the time came for me to actually write it, it just like came out in few sittings and um, yeah. Sorry, uh, I forgot that I was muted. Uh, thank you, Brahim. And we were very happy to be hosting you for the story that you published. Um, Sarah, um, why did you decide to write about, uh, about your piece of staying behind uh, or not staying behind, deciding to stay in Syria? And how was that linked to, to the topic of inner migration? Hey, Misha, and hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Musallah News. Uh, for this opportunity. 
Um, this is my second uh, article with you, and I'm really, really happy that I'm uh, joining you today. And thank you for giving us all the space to express ourselves and produce these articles that are actually really personal. Um, for me, actually, uh, when I saw the title Inner Migration, the, the only thing that came to my mind was like spiritual migration. This is, this is traveling to the deep layers of, of ourselves, of our soul, and how do we interact with ourselves and how do we listen to it? So um, I wanted to link both migrations, like the spiritual one, and the actual movement from one uh, country to another one. And um, how, in my personal experience, how these two migration actually intersected, how they affected each other, and how did that happen in Beirut, where um, it had been my sanctuary uh, for, for the time, and also a place where I connected the most with myself. So yeah, I wanted to talk about how, how this movement how uh, it had an impact on me and um, on the way I approached myself. Thank you, Sarah. Fatima? Hello, everyone. Thank you, Misha, and thank you for giving, giving us the opportunity, as Sarah said. Um, it was really nice journey working on this, um, on, on the story. Um, actually, at the beginning, when I have read the um, the the inner migration, I I like the first thought in my head was um, the like me when I have uh, moved from Syria to Lebanon. Um, this this was like my very big inner migration because at some point I lost my identity and just I had to rebuild everything. But that was a very big topic to to write about it. And I was thinking in the process uh, that, okay, if I didn't write about it, maybe I can write about, I mean, I, mean, I have moved from Lebanon to, to Berlin because that was kind of after I, I was started settling down, I had to move. And so I, have to, I had to leave everything. Uh, and I tried not to write, but, and then I have decided to send um, the email, I think at the last moment that, okay, let's try to, uh, to write about it. And I think this was one of the nice things that happened in the last last two months for me. So thank you. You're welcome. We're very happy about that. And what was interesting with your piece, actually, it feels like the moment was right because uh, as you were finishing, fi finishing up the piece, uh, you were saying that you were planning on returning to Beirut for a quick visit. And that was an interesting timing um, uh, because this, this is something that links all three of your pieces because all three of you have a story with Beirut in one way or another. And, um, and it's a place that, um, that has obviously uh, been through a lot this year. Um, it's a place where, um, where you guys have built some roots have built uh, a life, have had your links, your attachment to it. Um, and um, it was nice to see that in your three articles uh, because you built it in a different way, all three of you. What would you say your relationship to Beirut is in general? And why, why has Beirut figured so much in your story? Uh, maybe first, Ibrahim. Um. I mean, obviously it was so obvious to, for Beirut to figure in my story because it was uh, very much about the explosion in Beirut, um, which in a way kind of led to um, rethinking my relationship with the city uh, because I felt so estra estranged from the city um, when I came back to it. Uh, after a few months of recovering in the countryside. And I think uh, I also had to talk about this because um, in many ways, Beirut is home. And when this estrangement hits very close to home, um, I feel something is there. And the piece was trying to maybe explore, you know, this space of coming back into home, into wholeness, um, so yeah.
Yeah, it, um, it is not uh, always, I mean, at least this year, it has not been an easy city to connect with, for sure. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing that, Ibrahim. Um, I mean, I also wanted to ask Fatima about Beirut, because you are, I mean, you narrate this journey that many Syrians took of leaving Syria and then staying in Lebanon for a period of time before continuing to another country. Uh, so you're in Germany now, and uh, so you're not, I mean, you're not born in Beirut, you came to Beirut, you made it, you created a connection, and then you had to leave it. So, I mean, you speak a lot in your piece about, I mean, there you can sense that there's a lot of love for Beirut. So I don't know if you can say something about this, how this relationship was formed, and what, it, what the city meant to you, actually. Yeah, actually, I I formed the, this relationship with Beirut very late, like not very late, but it was after a few years of staying. I have stayed for six years. I think after three years, I started really connecting to the city. And this was kind of the open um, um, social um, container for me to, uh, to really start seeing who I am now and um, having new friends and going, to new places, and then this was this my this was my container to uh, in this in this um, in this time. So everything I have built after leaving Syria, which I almost I left everything and kind of forgot everything. So it was Beirut. So it was everything for me. I have relation very good relationship with Bika, but. Uh, because I was, my family is there and I was moving between both of them, but at the end, the, the place is limited. So I, like this movement between the city and the, um, and the countryside was always giving me the space, the space to grow in, in different, different ways. So yeah, Beirut was for me, like my city, because it was the only city that, um, that I have there. And so and and I have lots of loved ones there. So um, yeah, I I have very loving connection to the city. Thank you, Fatima. Uh, what was interesting with your piece, Sara, is that also as um, you talk about Beirut in such a descriptive way, of you were describing your trip, for instance, at some point uh, from Ledi. To Beirut, describing this uh, this road, the the uh, the like the names of the cities as you get there, while describing it, there's also a lot of love, a lot of feelings, a lot of wondering, also, but a lot of um, like uh, there are some questioning about treatment differences, um, how what makes us different. Um, you talk about the border experience, for instance, uh, that for nothing they, they see your papers and and and, and then dismiss it. Um, what can you say about that? Like, uh, how does that affect your relationship to the country and the city itself? And how did you build this kind of relationship? Um, actually, it's obvious that I'm in love with Beirut. Um, I wrote about it in my first uh, in my first article with Mashallah, and um, I kept writing about it. Like in every piece that I write, whether it's personal or it's going to be published, I found myself talking about Beirut. Like it's there, it's everywhere. Um, it's it had always been my muse. Uh, because Beirut um, opened doors for me, like um, professionally speaking and psychologically speaking. It was there that I connected the most with myself. Um, it was there that I, um, I know that I wanted to be a journalist. I've, I've known for like, for as long as I remember, I know that I want to pursue uh, a career on journalism and I wanted to be socially and politically active in my Syrian community. I've known that for, for a long time. But it was there in Beirut that I knew for sure that I was determined that I want to be a journalist and I want to be socially active in my community in Syria. And the reason for that is that because Beirut actually provided me with the tools and it provided me with the knowledge that I needed to be who I want to be. 
and who I want to do. And it gave me possibilities. It, it is the city for possibilities for me because um, it was there that uh, I can be whoever, whoever that I want. Like I can be a journalist, I can be activist, I can be a dancer or a singer. I can be whoever I want in Beirut. Give me the freedom and the possibilities. And um, the most importantly, the connection with myself, uh, the true connection with my true self for me was that. So I think, that's why I fell in love with the city. Pretty much, that was the reason. So it's uh, it's interesting that you said the city of possibilities. I'm thinking of uh, the um, outpost, Ibrahim, which is the magazine of possibilities, right? So I I just want to know if for you, like Beirut, had the same kind of uh, creative uh, importance and inspiration for your work. Oh, for sure. <laughs> I mean, Outpost was born in Beirut and then it traveled the whole world and it kept on coming back to Beirut. I mean, uh, it has obviously, I mean, it's its place of birth at the end of the day and where uh, we were based uh, throughout all the time we were publishing. Um, so yeah, for sure. But like, you know, I, I think that when a city undergoes such a mega event like the explosion that happened in August, I feel so much changes, you know, in the very fabric of the city. And I think this estrangement I was talking about, or like if we were to connect it to like inner migration, is to try to like find back some semblance of familiarity. Um, just maybe even some semblance of control when everything in the city seems to have become so out of control. So I think my journey back to Beirut, which I feel, I don't know, after I published, I wrote this piece, like I would go and sit at Cafe Yunus, which is close to my house and which was, um, so basically their old location closed down. And for me, when they closed, something in me died, something in my relationship with the city died because this cafe was the place that housed me for so many years. It was like the outpost offices for a few years. And then when this closed, something changed. And then they opened a new location and I went there and I wrote actually the, most of the text for Mashallah there. And I felt that just having those walks to the place and back and you know, just being there and trying to articulate all that had happened in the, in the five months before. I think something clicked, something changed, and I started to find that familiar, that Beirutness, if we were to call it, which I had completely lost touch with after the explosion. So now I'm in a place where I'm like, I'm back in the city and it does feel like home and I'm not estranged anymore. And I think in a way that is the product of the very healing process I embarked on after the explosion, but also writing it because I feel that something really changed in me after I wrote this text. Um, and obviously with my relationship to the city. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. I'm, uh... I mean, it's, uh, I'm at a, honestly at a loss of words. I'm trying to find my words like about reconnecting to the city after such an event. Um, but also it feels that it's not just this one event that changed the perception of a city. Um, like with the economic crash, with the shops closing, as you said, like thankfully for, for, for Cafe Yunus, they had another location because I remember we would bump into each other pretty often there um, uh, about also how the lockdowns, how the lockdown has changed also the, the city, like our perception to our city and the sense of belonging feels a bit like you, we need to rebuild something. Our, on our own too, and and these were the roots that we had that we had built throughout the years. That it feels like now we have to do it all over again. Um, yeah, go for it. Yeah, no, I just want to say about that because I feel I also wrote about like there is a sentence in the first part where I talk about seeing the pain in people's eyes, like just complete strangers out on the streets which is obviously a product of like all the pains we have uh, gone through in the past year, but like, and the crises and the traumas. 
But I think like trauma does strips us away from our agency. It does in a way makes us feel sometimes like completely and utterly hopeless. But at the same time, I think it connects us. And I just, just like like to go out on the walks and now like the sun is shining and so beautiful. And just like there's something about looking people in the eyes and connecting with them on whatever level. I think also these walks help me rewire my relationship with the city because the city is about the places we know and the people we know and just like the places and the people and just trying to connect or being able to connect with strangers on that level, knowing that we're all in this bubble of wackiness that's happening to us. Um, yeah, that's something. It's very true. And I'm also very curious about uh, the people who know the city, uh, but haven't seen this, uh, this change, have maybe perceived that change being away, of course, but haven't seen the city in more than a year. So I think about uh, Sara, yesterday we had, or before yesterday, we had a, a discussion about how last time you came to Beirut was, a, or to Lebanon was a year ago. So what is your perception being away and seeing that through a lens, through your friends, I guess, through the news and yeah. Um, I, I know that that the city that I'm going to see, um, I'm going to witness, I think uh, a year later, or I don't know where do I have the chance to go again. It's gonna be really different from the city that I've been uh, in, in, in uh, early 2020. Um, so I'm kind of kind of afraid um, of the relationship that it's going to be built. I think like there's gonna be a new relationship that is going to be built with with Beirut. Um, I know that the building changed and uh, many coffee shops closed and there's destruction and um, a lot of things that are actually similar to what happened to Syria. So, and for that reason, I, I grew estranged from, from Syria um, during the past years. So I kind of feel afraid that I'm going to feel the same thing for Beirut. But um, I know that deep down, like the bond with it is, is really strong and um, it, it's not going to change easily. But something in me is afraid that what would happen when you see a, a totally different Beirut than the one that you've been in, the one like with a lot of friends, and especially that most of my friends in Beirut actually left and they are not in Beirut anymore. I, I, I have only like two friends left in, uh, only two friends left in Beirut. So it's the same happening of what happened to me in Latakia. So it's the same, same thing happening in Beirut. Like people are leaving and the, the city is changing. And um, so, yeah, I'm kind of have this, oh, am I going to feel estranged from this city that I fell in love with and that I fell in love with myself um, in it too? So yeah, there's these questions and fears, of course. Can I, can I say something about this? Um, yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, like I think the cities are basically the like, uh, people and places are the lens through which we experience and see cities. And I feel that Beirut obviously changed so much for me because most of my good fr like fr friends left. A lot of the places I used to know closed down. But that was the previous lens I used to have to experience the city. And now I'm realizing with new people and new places that I kind of like changed the lens and I'm the see seeing new facets of the city, which I haven't known before or experienced before. And I think Someone wrote in the chat, for me, Beirut is the city of impossibilities. I really beg to differ. And going back to your gen question, Jenny, about you know, Beirut being the city of impossibilities. And I mean, just look at what happened after the explosion, how all of us came together to create goodness and help each other out. I mean, it's just fascinating to see uh, what we managed to do and all the possibilities that arose by just us coming together after that tragic event. Uh, and it's still showing like beautiful things are popping up in the city. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, interesting this kind of um, relationship of love that you both spoke about. So I was. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can share the piece. I was reading this piece um, where the author was writing about the relationship we build with cities and how 
we uh, kind of get attached to whatever is in the city the first time we come to a city. So we get attached to the pharmacy on the corner, the cat that is always on the street, like this little corner shop that we might, you know, we might not even shop from it, but it's for us, it's, it's part of our relationship to the city. So if it disappears at some point, we will really grieve it and we will not, you know, we will feel that something is lost in the city. Um, so I was now, like I was thinking about you all actually when talking about all of these things, because you have, um, you have not been also to Beirut in a while. So um, I'm curious to know how it was for you to, to create these uh, really amazing um, illustrations that you did that really like reflect I mean, I feel that they really reflected the, the atmosphere and the, the really the voice of each story. So how was it to create from like from afar? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. And thanks to uh, the authors for giving me the gift of illustrating their pieces. So uh, yeah, to, to answer your question, Jenny, uh, yeah, my relationship to Beirut is definitely really different to the one of the authors or you, I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's more been like this city, like where all my life with my family and then myself, it was like, um, are we going to go move there? Are we going to live there? And kind of like just never happened. But um, at the same time, like, it's still a city I feel a really strong connection to. And like, I was lucky to be there at the beginning of the Saura. So like my experience of this link I have to Beirut has evolved a lot, I guess, through my life while being like with a certain distance. But like, yeah, for, for illustrating these pieces, like let's say like these stories of migration, even though like they are very different from my story because like I'm more like the, children of immigration and what comes after. So we have like kind of different um, problems and stuff like that. But uh, I don't know, these stories, we kind of also grew up with them, like people like me. <laughs> and they are part of our DNA and how we like get to an understanding of who we are in the world, why, you know, things are like this, etc. So, but, um, yeah, like what was really strong in these texts, in, in my opinion, was like this, like two things, like really like this inner light, inner strength that like the, nearly all the authors were describing this like inner thing that came to both protect them and recenter themselves in this experience of like not really being sure about like belonging and this kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, there's also this link to the land, like in like these natural simple elements, like whether it's like the plants or whether it's like just the sun that kept coming back in all these stories. And so I don't know, somehow this was something like I really wanted to show in the pictures and that somehow I can relate to, because like if I'm in Beirut, like there are moments I feel like, oh yeah, I do have a link to this place. And then I'm like, no, I don't. But like the moments I have no doubt about my kind of belonging to Lebanon in somehow are really moments where I have this very simple connection to the like space around me, like even just the Mediterranean. And this is something that I also experience in France, like this kind of like, how do we root when it's not so obvious, like where do you come from is not an obvious question. But so yeah, <laughs> that's about it. That's beautiful. Um, and um, as you talked about inner strength, the link to the land, the sense of belonging, and we talked a lot about Beirut uh, also. Uh, I wanted to talk a bit uh, about identity because this, um, this is uh, uh, talked about, uh, you write about it in all of your pieces and uh, with your sense of belonging, with, through your different um, experiences, um, you talk about different ways of migrating. Um, and I am curious to know, first with Ibrahim, for instance, you talk about leaving the city and staying for a few months in the countryside. Um, do you consider your, yourself uh, that you have migrated since it's a different pace, it's a different life, also a different environment? Uh, yeah. You're on mute, you're on mute. 
Um, yeah, not really if you want to consider migration as, uh, I mean, I went to my hometown. I, I'm not estranged in my hometown. You know, there is not this feeling of I'm here and there's the other somewhere lingering somewhere. Um, so I didn't feel like um, migration in this way, but it was surely like if we were referring to inner migration as like just going back inwards to the self, um, it surely was a migration of that kind. Um, but also a journey of exploration, just going back to my hometown after so many years of being a stranger away. Um, and, you know, like, just understanding how things work over there, how people take care of the land, how the land works. Um, I would say so, yeah, it was more of a journey of exploration and then, you know, inner migration. Um, thank you. <clears throat> so this idea of exploration and adapting, I, I'll, uh, uh, the question is for Sara. Um, since your piece is about not deciding to stay, um, you talk about how you reconnect, you are reconnecting with your city with through your daily walks, for instance, and seeing the places where you used to hang out with the people who have left, for instance. Um, how does that, how do these changes affect your sense of belonging? I um, actually wanted to um, to talk about in, in my piece, I wanted to talk about how, like mostly we read about the challenges of the immigrants um, who left the country and the challenges with the host community and everything. But we rarely read or listen stories about uh, the people who actually stayed, who, who are left behind, who are right now um, alone with no loved ones or friends around. So I wanted to talk about them like through my personal experience. Like I'm one of them, I'm, I'm kind of left alone without my, my only brother and my best friends. And so, um, it actually the migration affected this migration around me affected the way I approach myself, the way I approach my inner issues, and um, it actually affected my self perception, how I see myself. Because we we know that most of us actually see ourselves in the eyes of our loved ones. So when these people are gone and they are not around you anymore, so you start to ask questions like, okay, who am I now? Like without the people that I love, I'm not seeing myself in their eyes. Like, who am I? Am I like, am I part of this collective or am I an individual by myself and I'm not part of them? And can I still be connected with them even after they gone, still be part of this connection, connected community, collective community of Latakia? And all of these questions of identity that not only the immigrant actually suffers from, but also the person who stayed, be, who is left behind, actually suffers from identity crisis. Like, who, who am I without the people that I love? And in a city that is changing, not only uh, with buildings and everything, but um, the community of it is changing and it's torn apart. So it's, it affecting, it's affecting us and I wanted to, like, to talk about it. Uh, I think it's so beautiful what you're saying, Sarah, and the way you wrote about it, because it's um, it ha kind of has to do with this kind of narrow idea we have of migration. You know, when we see this word, word in a headline or in the media, it, it kind of signifies something very narrow, this kind of migration that is um, that is part, part of the news, basically. So um, I think the way you wrote about these like subtle aspects of um, yeah, of not this direct migration. And um, Fatima, actually, your, I mean, your story is connected to this also because you, uh, so many of you have not read it because we kind of, we published it very late, like a few, yeah, just before we started this uh, talk. So Fatima described, you, I mean, you, you already told us that you lived in Beirut for a while and in Lebanon, and then you migrated to Germany. So this was like several years after many other Syrians uh, arrived in Germany. So you kind of came, you know, you came several year, years after. So you had your experience uh, kind of disconnected with the, the other, many of the other Syrians in Germany. You want to say something about this? 
Yeah, yeah. I, it felt like when I have arrived, it felt like I'm the last one who's um, arriving to the party because they came, they have their own stories. Like they have shared shared history, which everyone was telling me. And I am the, the newcomer who came and I am listening to all these stories, which I I don't share with them a lot with with how they they were formed and how they arrived to this point uh, and i was yeah it was it was not easy uh, and also it was not easy for me that the people most of them they came some of them they stayed a little bit in turkey or lebanon and then they decided to come but it was only for a short period of time while well, i have stayed for six years so i have a complete history and then I came and I'm still, I'm not starting from kind of the zero. So I also, I was treated sometimes like I'm, I'm very new and it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm introduced to the new world, which, is, which was not the case. So I felt at some point also me and them, they kind of like we put our past behind of us and we just now we are new ones and we started dealing with this kind of we need to change ourselves to be something else and this was really big pressure on me uh, and also I felt the pressure on them like how they also they everyone developed developed their identities uh, to arrive to this point uh, but yeah I'm, I'm still like this is still not a soft point for me that I'm, I'm still kind of negotiating every time with with this with this um, I, I didn't identities or communities because it's also it's formed they have like after five years they also have their conflicts and it's it was like kind of everyone has their own place uh, in the in the community and the society they they brought their projects everything that could come to the this place and now it's developing from kind of more uh, settled uh, settled point that the they are stable and they are developing from this point and um, so yeah well i'm still now like having small steps uh, seeing how, how the things will go on i think you are i mean you're describing something personal but also something universal this idea of growth and uh, development and change and how this is connected to uh, identity and how actually we transform when we migrate or not migrate um, I don't know, maybe before like we open for some questions, maybe Odd, I will just like to hear your thoughts about this idea because your illustrations were very much uh, reflecting this idea of growing, developing. I mean, there are like uh, plants and the greenery in many of the illustrations. So there's a sense of, at least to me, I felt that there was a sense of growth connected to this, uh, the topic of inner migration, like a sense of, um, connection to something bigger, connection to the to the to nature and to the world. Um yeah, like I don't know, I guess I I I visualize this as some kind of like process and in the end like I don't know, I have this further vision where I like it's part of also the history of like our people the world like all these migrations and at the same time like there's this contrast with like just the earth or like i don't know sometimes like i'm just like looking at the map and i'm like wow like all of this happening and in the end like this something we connect to is in the end the land not the borders not the countries or maybe it is but it's it's so complex and in that sense I I yeah I see it as a kind of process and something that can evolve through life also like that's at least what I've observed around me from like my family my community etc that it's like it's there is no moment where it becomes absolutely stable it, it it's more like something that evolves through a lifetime through families through communities and like this is yeah just yeah, growth, as you said, it's a good word, I guess. Thank you, Od. Um, we have one, uh, uh, I think Fatima, you wanted to, to add more about, about Beirut. Yeah, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that when I came to Beirut, I, I knew Beirut from the hardest places in it. I started knowing it like very well from Shatila and around. 
So I knew kind of the hard part of Beirut. And then I started going and knowing the, the other parts. And I think by by the time, like what I like about Beirut that it, it's pretty much like us. It's like had like all these parts that it's it's trying to kind of develop. And it's, it's still, at least like when before before like everything is, is developing now, I think it's it's a more harder place. But um, when I I like let's say before before the revolution, it's it's still kind of have like trying to 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 reform lots of aspects, and it's pretty much like all all the all the um, all the parts of it. It's it's like us. So I think also this is partially why. I feel like this belonging, like there is, uh, like once one uh, person described like the difference between Beirut and and Damascus. That Damascus is more like an old lady who's more like formed, and Beirut is still like younger and it's, and didn't know what to do. It's like more this teenager who's trying to grow up and it start like in all these parts to to kind of reform something or to show like it doesn't have an identity so we not not exactly but just like it's it's diverse so we try also through the city to kind of find uh, ourselves and we like all these different parts we we try to see where we belong like that also because um like the people they are like pretty much like alike like we are coming from the same place from the same culture so also like these differences coming from an old city to to uh, another place it also pretty much helps us like i, I would talk as syrians also to to reform our identities and kind of like a, a mean before uh, before we go to completely strange places so so yeah, just wanted to add this. You were smart. You actually are becoming younger and younger. So Fatima, <laughs> you went from being old to, to living in a youthful place. That's very Yeah, smart. yeah, I do agree. <laughs> That's a nice uh, perspective, Jen. Thank you, Fatima. I'm just worried about something. I saw that uh, the, the power went off for Hassan and I'm worried that it might go out for us too. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> Let's wait and see. Um, I have one last question, like to try to sum up uh, the original questions that we had and, um, and then we'll open up the floor for your questions. Um, throughout all of your pieces, you talk about, and your illustrations, you talk about a lot of emotions, like, and this year we went through so many emotions, like from loss, grief, um, anger, uh, to the nicer things of love, lots of it, of um, care, of seeing uh, the good things and, uh, and attachment and belonging and all of these things. How would you summarize um, your emotion in one word. I would start maybe with Ibrahim. <laughs> or two words, you can cheat. Mm. Uh, well, um, I mean, I probably would go for, um, so basically the emotion from last year, you mean? You're on mute, Mish. I thought I was unmuting myself when I was muting myself. Um, for, for now, I would say. The emotion for now, uh, lightness. I don't know, I feel there is a lot of lightness in the air, especially after I published this piece. <laughs> Great. Uh, Sara? Um, it's a hard question. It's a tricky question. <laughs> Um, I kind of feel like there is also in my article, there's coldness versus warmth, um, the cities and how you've like been the people who migrated and the people who stayed. So I think that I'm kind of fluctuating between these two emotions, like between being warm from the inside and super cold because the people that have left. And when they call me, like, I feel like, okay, it's, um, I feel I'm feeling warmth from them, but I can still feel that here I am I'm I'm cold without them, 
And um, so, yeah, it's fluctuating between these, these two feelings. And I think it was also obvious in my, uh, in my article. Thank you, Sarah. Fatima? Yeah. Mm. I, I don't know. I think there's two parts in me, like part that it's sad, but also part it was joyful. So still. Yeah. Okay. And Ot? Um, yeah, it's a bit tricky. I would say like doubt um, about like the possibility of like the in-betweenness kind of. So yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so these were the questions that we had. So we'll open up the floor for, or the Zoom, or how do we say it now, uh, for, for your questions. Um, so first, Sara, Lily. So Sara was, uh, she gave the comment of, yeah. the of impossibilities, right? So let's yeah, see. I think, it, I think it was more of a comment than a question. Uh, but but yeah, but I can I can say something about the. Uh, she, she says uh, her mind. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. I mean, I agree. Maybe like from a systemic point of view, uh, like basically the systems that oppress the city or the systems that kind of try to hold the city together, for sure, there is a lot of dysfunction, and from this dysfunction, like it's really hard to see any kind of possibilities. But what the possibilities that I was talking about was the very, like it was very DIY culture, you know, like us individuals, creative people taking it upon ourselves to explore what could happen when we come together, especially after the Beirut explosion. I, I feel what came out was just tremendous uh, that I can't just, you know, um, uh, say it's a city of impossibilities in this way. Thank you. Um, Samira? Yes, let me put the camera on. All right. Um, I would like to start by thanking everybody for sharing their stories. And um, I feel privileged to be kind of privy to your inner works. Um, first, Odd, I really uh, loved the, I mean, the pictures because they were very warm and inviting. It's like, here, here's my hand. I'm gonna take you slowly into the inner lives of these individuals. And that was very personal as well. So I enjoyed that. I would start by saying that Farima is one of my close friends and um, I feel blessed to have been part and still, I hope, of her journey ever since she arrived to Beirut. Um, so for me, her piece just reminded me of how much I miss her. Uh, Sarah, you are such a natural storyteller and um, I really enjoyed the piece. So I look forward to Thank read you. more uh, of what you've written. And Ibrahim's piece regarding the seventh chakras, the seven notes, that was like, <laughs> I was like blown away. I was like, I've never noticed that. So this was, really great. And this brings me to my question, which is, um, we've all experienced some kind of trauma, which is whether we inherited from our parents, the collective trauma that we have, the trauma that we're facing, the trauma that we faced from the explosion, from the war, from everything. So how did you manage to kind of interact with this inner struggle? Um, to reach this tipping point, to really break that inner silence and start writing, because it's difficult, it's not easy. It requires a lot of courage, a lot of, I don't know, a kind of tension between your different selves. And um, I'm quite sure it took a lot of uh, reflection, maybe some yoga for Ibrahim, I don't know, but um, I would really like to listen to your opinion regarding that, thanks. I mean, I couldn't do much yoga. I was like uh, in bed for for three months almost. Uh, but um, mental yoga. 
No, yeah, I mean, being in nature for sure helped, but also for me, it wasn't, it was never a question of if I would break the silence. It was just a question of when. Uh, and obviously the when came when these fine folks at Mashallah just gave me the space to, to, to articulate all that. But um, yeah, I mean, um, I think I couldn't write about it before I could really understand what happened to me and what happened and how what happened to me actually changed me. And before I could actually understand that while I was still in, the, in, in it, like throughout the process, I was just collecting data, I was just collecting information. And I was basically also recording like these little highlights and breakthroughs which push the healing forward. And I think once I finally emerged, not to say that I'm, I mean, in many ways I'm still in it, but like once I was able to just find my ground again and step a little, you know, take a step back and just look at what happened, I think it was then when I was able to um, write about it. And I feel the writing process was the tipping point. Uh, if you're asking about like any tipping point. Sarah or Fatima, do you want to uh, add something to this? Yeah. Thank you, Samira, first of all, for being here. And you are always putting me in a place where I don't know what, what to say. <laughs> um, but yeah, I will, I will just directly go to the question. Um, that like, I think writing is also part of, of the journey itself, of the journey of healing, of the journey of how we are expressing ourselves or dealing with all these traumas. Um, I, you know, that I always, I always struggle to write uh, or like I can write for myself, but I always struggle to form it in a, a way that it's, uh, that it's able to, or I trust it to be published. Um, but so I think I'm um, like, by the time it's like, we can allow ourselves to also to do uh, bad work. Like this is part of it also like a traumatic, traumatic, traumatized work, which is okay to, to have it. Uh, and yeah, it's, it, it will reflect us it, also like when we are not able to write, it reflects us, which is okay to not write sometimes. So yeah. Also, like the healing, the healing journey, it will take yoga and meditation and everything, and sometimes will not work, but it's okay also. I don't know if you want to share something, Sara. Otherwise, okay. Um, first, thank you, Samira, for your nice words and for the question. Um, actually, for me, is like like what Fatima said. Like writing is part of my was well, part of my journey of healing, but that writing, I mean, like writing in my notes, something that I felt like suddenly I, I I came to realize something that I truly feel. Especially in my walks, I used like to look at my phone and be writing things. And um, actually, most of my article was part like was the paragraphs were written before and uh, were written before, like in in um, in the shape of like fleeting passages in my notes. And um, the trip of kisses and dichotomies, like my first passage and the passage that I love the most, uh, is actually um, part of a story that uh, in Arabic that I wrote in my notes while I was going to Beirut. And um, so it was like um, like the article was a collection of these notes that I that I write of my feelings of what I feel like suddenly like emerged to do something to write something. So yeah, that pretty much was the process of of writing this article. It was like a collection of paragraphs that I that I wrote in my notes. So um, yeah. It's uh, beautiful to listen because we you know we read the story and we don't. Uh... We don't see the the full process behind. So if you think that an article is always like a collected series of different moments in someone's life, it's uh, it's really beautiful. Um, let's see. I, so Sarah, I think uh, Sarah Yassin, um, you you um, 
you wrote in the chat earlier that uh, Beirut is a city of impossibilities. Um, I think your mic is working now, right? Yes, hello, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, so nice to see friends, Clement, Misha, and Jenny, and uh, lovely to meet everyone, uh, although virtually. I, um, I like what Ode said earlier about being uh, in the in-between and um, what I gather from the, well, we're coming towards the end of the, the conversation. A lot of the authors have shared uh, in their pieces, but also today in the discussion, their inner, um, well, it's, it's about the self, the self, uh, and I tend to uh, be in the in-between because my relationship and my reading of the city is never from is never only from uh, uh, an impressionist or a writer or a flaneur or a walker perspective. Uh, having always witnessed the uh, the uh, the other side of things, like l'envers du décor. So even ten years ago, when perhaps a lot of us had those who had just moved, so we're listening from friends from Syria who some of them ha had lived for six years in Beirut prior to, I don't know when they left, but a lot of people who have witnessed Beirut in, in, uh, through a different light uh, in the last 10 years or 15 years, my experience of that was always different because I always saw the, uh, the other side uh, and, and it's also, if, if I may share, it's, it was also a frustrating feeling when everyone was experiencing the city in perhaps a, um, a boom of, I don't know, creative industry. I think of uh, the area of Marm Khayel, for instance, for those who, who have been or who don't know Marm Khayel or Jemais, the eastern part of Beirut, the industrial area, when, you know, the neighborhood was changing, when people were uh, enjoying these amazing uh, uh, heritage uh, buildings and gardens and uh, we were seeing people who knew the city who were working in the city or on the city were seeing things from the other side we're seeing what was happening and it was always you would always be caught in this moment where okay I want to be like I'm not going to say you but I want to be like everyone enjoying and seeing these amazing moments of lightness and light and plants and the ground and uh, but also I, I, I can't, so I was always caught in between. And for me, what happened since 2019 and the explosion is a culmination of this 10, 15 year frustration. Uh, and I'm not the only one who shares this feeling. So that's why I say that I don't, um, yeah, it's, it's this feeling of being stuck in between, of, uh, of wanting to feel this, these possibilities, which I do recognize and I do feel. Uh, and also perhaps once uh, my story with Jenny uh, will be shared, uh, we also wrote before August, 20, uh, August 4th, we wrote in May, April, May, March. Um, and I also write about the 90s. I grew up in Beirut in the 90s and I feel that in the 90s, I have this feeling that what what was happening before the, the explosion for me reminded me a lot of my teenage years in Beirut in the 90s when we felt this uh, feeling of ownership in the city and that every, everything was, was, could happen. So uh, going, going, going back to my comment about possibilities or not. Uh, but as, as I, I became more aware of how the city functioned or was dysfunctional, this, this lightness of being or this feeling of possibility uh, that perhaps comes from you know how I write or how I experience the city or my memories and um, throughout the years I've also been in, in and out so left and came back and came back and left uh, have dissipated have gone uh, so that's why hence my comment about uh, my feeling of in, impossibility or uh, in at this moment in time. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so another person who has contributed to the series is Hassan, whom we don't, we have never met yet. Uh, so I'm glad to see your face. So <laughs> I'm glad that the event is there that we thought about talk, chat, chatting to the talking to each other live in a way. Um, so your piece, like I'm linking to what you said, Sarah, about uh, being stuck in between, there's frustration, 
and possibilities and impossibilities. Um, Hsen, you wrote uh, one of the most creative pieces that we had in, in the series with, um, uh, it was uh, the story of the brothers um, that uh, some decide to stay in the country, others, um, uh, and one decides to, to sorry, two decide to leave the country, one decides to stay, and those who left wanted to, to join uh, the mother. And so it was like explaining um, what happened in this process and the disappointments and the hope also at the same time. Uh, can you please tell us, um, like, how did you think of that story when you read the topic, the inner migration uh, series? Uh, and what was your process getting to the story? Okay, thank you so much, Misha and everyone else. Um, also, thank you all for uh, giving me um, this opportunity to express myself here and uh, by writing the story. Um, to start with, the, the story that we will to be published is actually a true story. So it's not from my imagination. It happened actually. And um, as Ibrahim said, and others also, uh, just writing, um, it expresses the feeling and the inner emotions that you hold through years. Um, Samira also mentioned something about traumas that we have built uh, our lives or inherited traumas from our families, from our parents. And then we experience that through the difficult times in Lebanon and abroad even. Uh, so through writing, we actually um, express ourselves more and we alleviate this huge um, emotions that we hold in ourselves. Um, the story is actually talking, when it be published, it's going to talk about um, desperation, it's going to talk about injustice, it's going to talk about um, deception, um, it's going to talk about how some people are just enjoying their lives on a usual day, uh, despite everything, while the rest of the world is struggling in silence. And through the pieces and through the words that I'm writing, I'm trying to achieve um, a goal that those people who have the word un unheard or uh, in silence to be to be heard eventually, um, to be known, to be in public, to to tell about themselves that uh, it's not always about physical injuries and wars. It's sometimes about um, the, the emotions, it's about the sentiments, it's about um, how you are hurt from your inside. Um, and that's that's the worst thing that you can do because um, it will deny you as a person from being productive in any society in the world. Uh, when someone is injured, I think he might be recovered within a few years and then he will be productive later on. But when you are hurt from inside, you are deprived from your um, right to live and to prosper and to develop you'll be excluded actually eventually from the society as a whole thank you so much Hassan. um i think your piece will be published is it next week or the one after but soon <laughs> it's uh, the next week um uh, we're gonna have one last question uh, audrey uh, if you can ask it are you still here Yes, I'm there. Um, actually, <laughs> can you hear me? It's more a reflection and a real question. Um, it's interesting because I, I, I was really a lot with plants and seeds in the last days and and all the time you were, there was like this nature thing, the olive tree, the, um, the plants, the growth. And for me, I had to, to think about seeds all the time, you know, seeds of the sprouts. And, and for me, it's really more a reflection, but how much you think that also nature or being inspired by the world of plants or nature can also ins inspire your, your life or, or how you can use this concept of seeds to, to move on because seeds are basically the part of the plant that is moving on, that is making the migration of the plants basically possible. So, so it's like this connection to nature, but also how we can be inspired by nature and by seeds, how they heal when they are really in distress, you know? It's really more a reflection than a question. I know it's it's not very clear. But 
but it does make me think a lot about what Od has done with the work, um, like uh, in the yes, visual. also also because of the of the of the um, the plants and and also of the I mean everything and all all the stories I had and also the visuals made me think so much about this concept of seeds. I don't know why, but maybe it's because I had to deal a lot with seeds in the in the last days. Maybe it's because of that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Jen. Yeah, I was, um, you know, throughout this conversation, I was like, we kept coming back. First of all, we kept coming back to Beirut. So we have to maybe, I mean, this is not a talk about Beirut, actually. <laughs> but we, we um, when we were preparing the questions, we kept coming back to Beirut. And we, I mean, we keep coming back to Beirut again. So, uh, I mean, I think it's connected to this thing that we spoke about, this dichotomy of uh, impossibilities, possibilities, because Beirut is so much a city of, migrants for migrants with migrants in a sense that um, i mean it's it's not kind to it's not a kind city for migrants in one way but it's also i mean the city is constantly um, it's constantly changing so it's a city where you it feels that you can always migrate to people are always migrating to and from the city so in a sense it's not strange that we keep coming back to beirut when we speak about uh, migration because it's so defined by um, I mean, it's so defined by coming and going. Maybe it's the fact that it's located on the sea, that it was throughout history a place where you would, um, you know, where you would uh, connect the land, the sea, other places. So, uh, so maybe this is the answer to why we keep uh, talking about Beirut when we're when we're discovering, yeah, discussing this topic. Yeah, that's very true. Like when we we're brainstorming those ideas and we're trying, no, let's like get out from Beirut and we would get back to it while discussing it but I think one of other reason also is that Beirut is the city that brought us together like at least uh, uh, around this panel and for the series and we've all met in Beirut and so I think it's maybe like it's uh, it's the natural also link for now uh, now that we're kind of stuck also and not able to travel as much as we would want to if we want to um, so yeah um, we're gonna wrap up. Um, we were very, very happy to uh, to host you. We hope you, that you enjoyed the discussion. I wanted to thank uh, everyone, uh, to thank Ibrahim, Fatima, Sara. Sara, the connection lasted and it was awesome. Od, um, <laughs> Jen and, and, and Clément, and, and um, thank you so much for everything. And um, we hope you enjoyed it. Please keep on following uh, the stories as they come out. Uh, we're very proud with the end result and we hope you'll enjoy reading them too. Bye bye. Thank you, Misha, and thank you everyone. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye everyone, thanks.